The Sahara. Today, the name conjures images of an immense, unforgiving ocean of sand and rock stretching across North Africa under a relentless sun. It is one of the harshest environments on Earth. But rewind the clock a few thousand years back, and the picture is different. Between roughly 14,000 and 5,000 years ago, the region we now call the Sahara pulsed with life. It was a period known as the African Humid Period. It was driven primarily by subtle shifts in Earth's orbit, the Milankovitch cycles, which altered solar radiation patterns and significantly strengthened the African monsoon. This intensified rainfall pushed northward and transformed the arid Sahara into a landscape hospitable to a wide array of flora and fauna. It was a green Sahara, a land of sprawling savannas, abundant lakes, and flowing rivers. This landscape supported a rich ecosystem, teeming with animals we might associate with regions far to the south today. And crucially, it was home to humans. Ancient peoples thrived here, hunting, fishing, and eventually learning to herd livestock. For decades, the traces of these early inhabitants have been studied by archaeologists. Rock art depicting long-gone animals and human activities, scattered tools and fragments of pottery hinted at vibrant communities. But fundamental questions remained. Who were these people who flourished in the Green Sahara? What was their story? Where did they fit within the complex web of human evolution and migration? In the early 2000s, deep in southwest Libya, near the border with modern-day Algeria, a team of archaeologists exploring a rock shelter known as Takar Kori made a remarkable discovery. Within this natural haven, they unearthed the remains of 15 individuals. These were the people of the Green Sahara. Among them, two were exceptionally preserved, not merely skeletons, but naturally mummified bodies, their skin, tissues, and even ligaments still partially intact after millennia. Scientific analysis would later reveal these were two women, likely in their 40s when they died, buried approximately 7,000 years ago. Found alongside them were clues to their way of life, shards of pottery, indicative of settlement and storage, and the ever-present rock art. The evidence suggested these individuals, and likely the community they belonged to, sustained themselves through a mix of hunting wild game, fishing in the nearby waters, and significantly, herding domesticated animals like goats and sheep. The discovery was profound, but the genetic information of the mummified remains held the potential for even deeper insights. Ancient DNA is notoriously fragile. Environmental factors play a critical role in its preservation. Cold, dry, stable environments, like permafrost or deep caves, are ideal. The Sahara, with its intense heat and dramatic temperature fluctuations between day and night, is perhaps one of the worst places imaginable for DNA survival. Early efforts managed to recover mitochondrial DNA from the two women. This type of DNA, passed down solely through the maternal line, offered a valuable but incomplete glimpse into their ancestry. However, advancements in genetic sequencing technology enabled scientists to eventually achieve a breakthrough. The researchers recovered enough high-quality ancient DNA from the petrous bones, a dense part of the skull near the inner ear known to preserve DNA better, of the two 7,000-year-old Takarkori women to sequence their whole genomes. This marked a landmark achievement, the first time complete genomes had been retrieved from human remains of this antiquity from such a hostile, hot environment. The genetic analysis revealed that these individuals belonged to a previously unknown human lineage. They were largely genetically distinct from other known ancient populations. Their genomes showed no significant genetic intermingling with populations typically found in sub-Saharan Africa to the south. Equally surprising, there was little evidence of genetic input from the Near Eastern or prehistoric European groups situated to the north. This genetic isolation was particularly noteworthy because these people were practicing animal husbandry. The domestication of animals like sheep and goats is understood to have originated outside of Africa, likely in the Near East. Therefore, the idea and practice of herding had clearly reached them. Yet, this cultural innovation appeared to have arrived without a corresponding large-scale movement of people carrying those Near Eastern genes. These Green Sahara herders seem to have adopted the practice without significant genetic mixing with the originators of that practice. So perhaps their ancestors came from the North or East. 
the researchers looked for connections to the Levant, the Near East, a region known to have influenced North Africa later in history. A key marker here is Neanderthal DNA. Modern humans encountered and interbred with Neanderthals in Eurasia. Consequently, all non-African populations today, and ancient Eurasians, carry a small percentage, typically 1-2%, to 2 of Neanderthal ancestry in their genomes. Sub-Saharan African populations, whose ancestors largely remained within Africa, generally have very little or none. The Takarkori woman with the best-preserved genome had only a vanishingly small trace of Neanderthal ancestry, about ten times less than modern Eurasians. This strongly suggested her ancestors had not recently come from the Levant or Europe. They were deeply rooted in Africa. Looking deeper into the genomes, the researchers uncovered an even more profound aspect of this ancient lineage's history. Analysis of their mitochondrial DNA, mtDNA, which traces the purely maternal line of descent, provided another intriguing clue. Their analysis indicated that the ancestors of these green Sahara individuals likely diverged from the ancestral line leading to modern sub-Saharan African populations an astonishingly long time ago, perhaps around 50,000 years back. And then, somehow, this group remained largely genetically isolated for the subsequent tens of thousands of years, right up until the time these women lived, 7,000 years ago. This finding directly contradicted a prevailing theory among researchers. For years, the Green Sahara, during its wet phase, was hypothesized to have acted as a major corridor, a pathway for human migration and genetic exchange between North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. The expectation was that evidence of significant gene flow across this verdant landscape would be readily apparent. One would naturally anticipate more genetic mixing across the Green Sahara during this period. Instead, the genetic evidence from the Takarkori mummies points toward a different mechanism for the spread of pastoralism. Researchers proposed that this nomadic lifestyle, centered around herding livestock, likely spread across the Green Sahara primarily through cultural transmission. It suggests that ideas, techniques, and practices moved between different groups, rather than the region being primarily shaped by large groups of people migrating and interbreeding extensively. It was an exchange of knowledge, rather than a large-scale mixing of populations. The sequencing of the Takarkori genomes represents a landmark achievement. It's the first time whole genomes have been successfully recovered from human remains in such a challenging, hot, arid environment. It reveals the existence of a long-lost population who carried an ancient legacy, potentially stretching back into the Ice Age. It demonstrates that genetic history and cultural history do not always walk hand in hand. A population can maintain its distinct genetic heritage while actively engaging in cultural exchange and adopting new technologies like pastoralism. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed, like, share, and subscribe. Until next time.